I last gave this talk, or parts of this talk, in Puerto Rico in 2003 at PMG, and that's why I have the title. Because at the time, um, the news that I had uh, about some of these topics was actually somewhat depressing and difficult, and actually for the last, uh, let's see what, I'm bad at math, so the last 13 years until the most recent revision of NFPA 40, which I'll get into what that is, um, there really was a problematic aspect to taking care of your cellulose nitrate film. But I'll, I'll, let, me, let me just go back and talk about cellulose nitrate, the first film. This is a bit of a quick reprise of what has already been covered very well by some of our other speakers this morning. But um, it's interesting. So Fernanda, this beginning date of any photographic process is always so exciting because you have to put a date down um, so that then people disagree with you or they use different dates. So I was in a bit of a panic when she said 1887 because I'm like, what do you mean 1887? I, so so th this, this is because I clearly chose the Kodak introduction date of the flexible film, not the more rigid film that she described. But again, just be careful with your dates. But that's why I have 1989. And then 1950s because as I'll get into a little bit later, there's a time period where it's getting phased out. You can particularly, you have a lot of dates um, that are sort of Kodak related to the US, and I'll make a call for people's information about uh, film use in their parts of the world, because I think we're clearly finding in pockets of our collections that nitrate is continued to use well past that 1951 date that we commonly use, but I'll get into that. But why use it? I mean, it's actually a really great material. It's strong. It's transparent, it's durable. I think it was relatively uh, inexpensive to make, particularly compared to acetate. Um, but it did have some issues. And uh, its biggest one is that it is, it is a hazardous material. And I don't want to make, I don't want to overly dramatize this, but it is, a, it is a technically a hazardous material. It is a class 4.1 flammable solid in the United States, um, which is important for a lot of things. It means it's not explosive, and it means it's not, in the spontaneous combustion class. So people will make both of those statements, and it's, it's technically not correct. It's a class 4.1 flammable solid. So it is unusual for a cultural uh, material to be a hazardous material, but it is, it is what we have. Um, and you really do have to be mindful of safety first. There were discussions of fires in various repositories, the, clinic, uh, the Cleveland Clinic fire uh, in particular, People do die in these fires. They, it's a serious issue. But people die in other kinds of fires, too. Libraries and archives have lots of paper. Uh, lots of buildings have parking garages underneath them with actually explosive fuel in all of the cars. And people don't get in a panic about that. But when you say that there's cellulose nitrate in your institution and people don't know about it, they get excited in a kind of irrational way. So part of what I'm trying to explain to you is some of the basics. And to, because you will know after the basics probably more than anybody else in that building on this topic. And you need to be confident in what you know, and you need to be a good advocate for these materials because, in fact, they're quite, quite good materials if you take care of them properly. This is a nitrate uh, negative. Uh, it's from FSA from about 1942. Uh, from not that far away, I couldn't find an, a Tucson or Arizona nitrate negative. Uh, I was irritated about that. This is as close as I could get. It was safety related and it was from Las Vegas. So it was, it was pretty close. <laughs> so, yeah, so just fire. I mean, it's, it can, th this is where there were some National Bureau of Standards, the predecessor to NIST, did some tests on behalf of a lot of the archival community in the 40s. Uh, they were burning hundreds of pounds of film and it does have explosive like qualities because it burns so quickly, it generates a lot of gas and it can find in, uh, enclosure or space, it will actually create so much pressure that it will cause problems that are like explosions. But it's really more about the way in which it's, it burns, not in the way in which it actually is as a material. And that's why it's that 4.1 material. But it's not something to be trifled with. Uh, in 2003, and I know some people will be disappointed because they'll expect some really cool video of, of fire. Um, we didn't have YouTube, so just go to YouTube. Lots of cellulose nitrate examples. And, but to my eye, they're a little sad. They're really about sort of destruction for the sake of destruction, and it makes me sad. Um, so I didn't want to show them. But uh, if you want to see a fire, Cinema Paradiso has an example of cellulose nitrate fire from a projector. And Inglorious Bastards has a whole part where it's a very critical part to the plot, which I won't get into. But if you want to know about nitrate fire, you, those are good places to see them. So. This is for acetate film, but uh, you can really apply it to nitrate film as well in, in a broad sense, in that, that 
it has this, these plastics have this unusual material or quality where most things just deteriorate at this nice gradual slope. It just goes like this. But these have its autocatalytic component where it feeds on itself after a period of time and the deterioration really takes off. So with both of these plastics, it's important to just know where you are. So that was one of the things John Louis was talking about. Are you near this point? Are you after it? Are you before it? And then do things like cold storage to slow that down. So you're advancing on this curve is just as slowly as you can. Um, so it's interesting to consider there are aspects to film deterioration that do have a quality of patina. Uh, mirroring is one of them. So I would say that one of the goals I would, I would posit um, is that we're just trying to make things slowly deteriorate, sort of the way paintings do or good quality papers do, not happen where they're unusable in your career. Um, so cold storage does that, and it keeps things from doing this. This is where it, gradually the gelatin um, gets tacky. It breaks down because of the nitric acid that's generated in enclosures and other things stick to it, gets stuck to itself. Um, in a film can, it does this turns into hockey pucks and other kinds of nasty things. And it's quite true that by the time you get to this point, this material is considerably more flammable than when it's in good condition. So you'll often see in the literature that it can burn spontaneously in conditions as low as, say, 120 degrees. That's if it's in that condition, in very poor condition like this, for many, many days. Generally speaking, good quality film, even film probably in this state, has a flash point of about 300 Fahrenheit degrees, which is, is, you know, most storage environments aren't 300 degrees and likely to get at 300 degrees. So, you know, paper has a flash point of somewhere between 400 and 600 degrees. So, in and of itself, as long as you don't catch it on fire, it's a pretty safe material. But that's the, that's the kicker, because when it catches on fire, it generates its own oxygen, and it's very difficult to put it out once it starts. And so that's why it burns so quickly. It generates that kind of explosive gas quality, or it's, it's, it spreads very quickly. It's very hard to put out. So the key thing is, like with all of our cultural property, we actually don't want it to catch on fire. So let's just try hard to make sure it doesn't catch on fire. And I think when you go through the literature on why cellulose nitrate fires happen, they really happen because people aren't doing a good job of taking care of them. If you do a good job of taking care of them and you know sort of the parameters, which I'll go into, you really don't have an unmanageable level of risk. And we have a very extensive amount of material at the Library of Congress. We have close to a quarter million um, nitrate negatives of different vintages as early as the very early days of film. These are from Arnold Genta, um, views of San Francisco before the earthquake. Um, these are in very good condition, by the way. I survey them from time to time. We have also during um, FSA, Farm Security Administration, we have a lot of material. This isn't from FSA per se, but it's from that same time period. This is a uh, set of prints and negatives from Ansel Adams um, of the Manzanar um, internment camps. And he gave them to the library expressly so that we had a record and we were holding it of what happened. He, was, he didn't think it was a good idea to have done it. Um, and I think the negatives are a critical part of that story. It's that he had finished prints and negatives. He wanted us to have the evidence of this. He didn't want it just to be prints. He wanted us to also have the negatives. So getting into that, we have, a, we have an archive of printing practice. We have evidence of these different materials. And so some of these are acetate, some of them are nitrate. And then we have iconic images. Uh, this is probably one of our most iconic a photographic images at the library, Migrant Mother, which is from Farm Security Administration and is a nitrate negative. So this was always something interesting when you were looking at, at it in FBA 40 um, because they would say, well, generally people are copying their film and, and, um, and disposing of the nitrate. And that's just not our practice with still picture film, for sure. We're not, we're not gonna get rid of this. We're not gonna get rid of this. Uh, we're probably not even going to get rid of this. I mean, this is critically important documentation of baseball, but um, <laughs> it's on nitrate. But we have a huge, you know, all of our repositories of nitrate have, have examples like this. I had dates there, and one of the things to keep in mind is that we, as I mentioned before, 
you know, this 1951 date is kind of thrown out there as a very broad date, but in fact, Codex publication from 1979 outlines for their materials in the US um, other dates that um, for different classes of material, and this is actually quite helpful if you're, if you're trying to determine things where you don't have good edge markings or other ways of identifying it. If you have a good date or a somewhat reliable date, this can be a helpful, this can be a helpful thing. Now, some of this is in um, a frequently asked questions type of format of article about cellulose nitrate that's in, I think, topics eight. I need to revise all of this as we'll get to. You'll see there's been some significant changes. So I'll be revising all of this and it'll probably be in the next topics um, and it'll have a lot of this information that you'll see in the slides. So, um, so we have a lot of nitrate at the library and um, during my time there, we've actually um, built new nitrate vaults. So we're one of the few places that have recently built a nitrate vault. The others being the National Archives of Canada, slightly after ours, um, the film archive at UCLA and uh, the MoMA film, the, uh, excuse me, the MoMA film vault. So this is a very, very large facility. It has 124 rooms like this. Uh, 118 of them are for motion picture film and six of them are for still picture film, which gives you a sense of the scale of this. But this is a hallway. It goes all the way down here and then it turns and goes down this way about as far. So it's right, you can see this is a picture of the, uh, where our motion picture campus is um, in uh, it's sort of far remote uh, suburban Virginia from Washington, D.C. That this is an overhead view. This is this courtyard here. So you can see that this, this number of this hallway is about as long as this building is wide. It, it's big. So we have, we have a lot of nitrate film. And because we have so much motion picture film, we've always historically incorporated the still picture film um, into that broader care. One of our challenges when we were designing this is that a lot of work went into building these compartments. This is, uh, this is the kind of material or kind of uh, approach that's, t that's explicitly described in NFPA 40. Uh, but um, we created our own set of cabinets because at the time NFPA 40 didn't really outline what to do with still picture film particularly well. Um, and uh, so we created a, a new set of compartments that follow the same rules as motion picture film that take into account the fact that you need to store film on edge. It's typically in sleeves. You don't want to put it in a film can. I think it's one of the reasons why anecdotally we have nitrate still picture film in good condition because the paper sleeve that it's typically in is, is actually, I think, beneficial to it. And being in a metal can, I'm not so sure is such a good idea. So there was some discussion early on, well, why can't I just take all my film like this and just put it in film cans? And I was just like, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to do that. That's not good practice. But that's that's where there's elements of the standard that were so film oriented, motion picture film oriented, that it made it kind of difficult. There was a lot of education. So the reason I'm talking about this is that as a fire standard, NFPA 40 is typically um, cited in most building codes in the United States. And actually it's, it's a frequently cited standard outside of the United States too, uh, by other governments, other national entities. There's some rules about transporting it and there's some rules about disposing of it. And I'll go over these pretty quickly. And again, some of this is, is, is in the topics article and will be in the revised one. So NFPA 40 just had a revision in 2016. Um, and that's, that's where there's a lot of really good news. And so I'm just going to briefly update you on some important things. Some of this is the same as the previous one. But if you have nitrate material, um, you really should it, um, be familiar with NFPA 4016. It's not particularly expensive. It's about $46. And you can download it pretty quickly. But it applies to everyone, whether you have still picture film, motion picture film. Um, the original standard for decades of time only ex covered motion picture film. And so you're sort of in the, you didn't have much helpful guidance on the still picture side. Um, so it includes both. And um, it also now has language that's a little more helpful that really describes that you can have things in permanent storage, which is helpful. Uh, because there is this notion of, well, if this is so dangerous and so problematic, why don't you just copy it and, and get rid of it? And um, for all sorts of reasons, that's not a good idea and li not likely to happen. So it's nice to have the standard explain it that way. The standard also has a, a peculiar aspect to it that it's, it, it describes itself as a retroactive standard. So a lot of standards will be that, like with, say, your building in your house, that your house gets built at a certain time and it's built to code at that time. And you say, well, it doesn't, if you were to build it now, it wouldn't be following code, but because it followed code when it was built, it's still considered in code. 
In the case of this standard, however, it explicitly says that it's not that way and that you have to follow the standard whatever the most current version is. So, so over time, you have to keep up with when the new versions come out. And if people are watching this webcast in, say, three or four years, if it's 2020, um, you should be mindful that there probably is another standard under revision. Um, it gets very tricky. Uh, we follow, for various reasons, two different versions of NFPA 40 because of the way the building code works in Virginia, and at least our part of Virginia for that building, is that we actually follow the building code of the time when it was built, and it doesn't matter what the standard says. So this gets also very legally and complicated. So I, as a disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a transportation expert. I know about preservation of these things, but when you have it, uh, this filament, particularly in large quantities, you really do need at some point to get involved with other parts of your institution, safety officers, possibly legal counsel, on how you're managing this as a risk, because it's a safety standard. It's a, sa it's a safety issue. It has a nice issue, though, of equivalency, which it, it, it explicitly says that if you can come up with something that is just as safe, you don't have to follow this. So this was always an aspect of something that we tried to follow, where if we were straying away from what the standard said or didn't say, we felt confident that we were doing something that was equivalently safe. And often it was equivalently safe and, um, and actually better for the material, cold storage being one of those examples. So you, so now we're getting into real brass tacks kind of things. Um, this standard came into being because for a long time motion picture film was a, it, it was a huge industry, transporting, transporting, transporting film, um, sending it to different theaters, um, getting those, those copies ready, so that there were a lot of rules that were basically making this remain viable because of the importance of the motion picture industry in this country and the demand for people to want to see movies. So now you can have what's described as everything in the standard, in the actual explicit part of the standard, the, the front part of the standard, is in, is in feet and rolls because it's all about motion picture film. And so we, when we started following the standard in the mm, 80s, uh, we, we did a lot of work to figure out equivalent weights of, of still picture film, which I'll get to in a second. Um, there's now an annex that describes similar weights um, in the standard, which is very helpful. Um, but it's basically two standard rolls per person in a room, and any room where you have more than 10 standard rolls, you need an automatic sprinkler system. So these are just some of the, the basic rules. There are a lot more in the standard, but you need to be mindful of whatever you have out. You, you probably should, you shouldn't really have more than 10 pounds. The, the biggest problem with earlier versions of NFPA 40 were that they really did not do a good job of describing what you should do with relatively small amounts of film. And now it's much clearer, and this is probably the best news of the whole thing, is that you are now encouraged to put things in cold storage. And you can put less than 25 pounds in a laboratory, what they describe as laboratory grade refrigerator or freezer. And that's really great. People have been doing this for many decades of time. It's a recommendation in Henry Wilhelm's book on um, color deterioration and film deterioration. And it would be the kind of advice from a preservation point of view that I would make to people that have particularly small amounts of film, but then I would have to qualify it by saying, and you're not following the standard, and you'll have to make sure that that's okay with everybody, but it, it's better to have the film in the cold. And I don't know of any fire that's happened because of being stored in these, um, in these types of, of arrangements. So this isn't very much as we'll get into, but it is something. The other very important thing is that they say between 25 and 750 pounds, you can put it in a freezer, you just have to comply with these parts of the of the uh, standard, which basically I think means, I need to work with some architects and engineers on this, but I think you could construct a ballet box that could follow these rules. You, you, you actually, you wouldn't have to build a technical vault. You could build a ballet box with certain fire protection um, uh, walls, four hour rated walls, possibly one hour rated walls. I'd have to look in the standard, but it's, you need an event for gases and some other things, but it's, it's actually doable. And then you, then you get into what we call the vaults like I was showing, for over 750 pounds. And the 750 pounds is, is roughly speaking one half of that wall in the vault. So it's, it's many document boxes, record storage boxes worth of, of film. So here's an example. Heather, this may look familiar to you. This is the, uh, the small freezer that holds some other Gentha negatives. Um, 
at the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. So this was an example where when I was working with their staff and they were asking me questions about it, they said, well, we're, we're putting it in this freezer. Is that a good idea? And it's like, well, yes, it's a very good idea in my view. Um, but you can't really explicitly do that. And so now they can. So now it's all, th this is from their blog post. So this is, this is free and, and out there. But this is their night. This is about probably a few pounds. And it's in this nice little freezer. And based on the, the charts and other things, that it'll last for literally centuries of time in here. So it's, it's now a very stable, very stable place. So here's the, here's the as I said, th this is not that changed from uh, what's in the topics article. Um, Sarah Wagner in the 80s weighed a lot of film with my colleague Donna Collins. Um, we then, once I got to the library, we, we redid this. And then when we started having to move film, we did it again. So we've, we've weighed film. Um, three separate times, and we feel very confident of these numbers. So this gives you a sense. So when you're reading the standard, you can say, you know, one reel, five reels. The limit for use is now at 10 pounds. This is a, this is a slight error. So it's, th but this is a reasonable amount of material to have out at time. And then th this is the comparable amounts. The NFP 40 standard currently in the in the annex describes 8 by 10 and 5 by 7 amounts and doesn't do a good job of describing these other formats. And I would say it's a shame because you, in fact, 8 by 10 film, in my experience, is much thicker than the other formats. And so it actually it gives you a false sense of how little you can have in a given space. These formats are much thinner. Nitrate's very strong. So um, they, it, it's, a, it's good for thin kinds of film so that you really can have more material than you would think if you were just cutting down 8 by 10 film. So I feel very confident of these numbers. And what I would say, if you have large amounts of film, you should just weigh some of your film and, and find out what your film weighs. And I think that would go a long way to describing to somebody that you've done your due diligence. It's not, you know, yes, the chart says this, but I've weighed my film, and I know how much it weighs. So that, that's, not, that's not too difficult. The other nice thing about the standard, well, I'll, I'll, let me just show you a picture of a vault. So, so this is a, a sort of typical nitrate vault. And this is a more typical, I think this is actually a narrow vault. Um, it's a, it, but it's like a, just a large room. It's from Steve. I had it, got it a long time ago. But it's just, you can see, it doesn't have compartments. There's a lot more material in here. These have separate fireproof compartments. The idea being that a fire can start in one of the compartments. It won't spread to the other cans. And then there are deluge uh, sprinklers up here that will, um, uh, that will arrest the fire. So you might only just have some loss if you had a fire start in here. Um, our conditions for our vaults are 35 um, Fahrenheit, about 3 centigrade, and 30% relative humidity. And that has a lot of, to do with the scale of material that we have and, then, and the desire to not have water freeze in our, in our pipes. Um, I think now we can consider other options for some more valuable film because we have these other options, which we didn't have before. And we may consider that. Um, I feel very comfortable with 39 Fahrenheit for, I mean, in my career, it will not change significantly. Um, but I think if you really are thinking about a 500-year horizon, a 1,000-year horizon, a colder temperature than 39 is probably a good idea. Um, but keep in mind that um, better can be the enemy of good. It's better for you to just get it at 39. And my predecessor, if they want to tackle this, they can make it colder than 39. Uh, I've, you know, we have film now in very good, um, in very good environment. Um, it'll last unchanged for maybe acquiring a little patina. I like that idea. Um, over decades of time, but not, not a loss of the, of the collection. So storage. So you can put it in a film can. The standard is real helpful about that. Film can, great. I'm not going to put my film, my still film in a, in a film can. Um, so you have to put it in a DOT-approved container, which is kind of called a 4G box. So then you have to do lots of work. This is my wife. Um, she worked at the uh, Smithsonian Archives. They have a lot of nitrate film, and we store their film for them. And uh, so she was having to refile all of her things out of, out of document boxes into these other boxes. So we, we had to do a lot of that for some moves. Um, but it basically it gets put into a liner box that's made out of good quality material. And then you put it into the 4G box. And um, you have these two layers. This is what the standard says. I need to revisit this. There's some rules that have changed. It appears on the 4G box side that I want to clarify so that I can give you better guidance about putting um, things in the right kind of container. Um, it seems a little strange if you're really not going to move your material much to have it in a, t in a transportation rated thing when it's just going to stay in your vault and it's going to go outside to your staging area and back. Um, but that's the way the standard's written and it's just an element of, um, that you have to be aware of. 
The other really, really helpful thing about the standard right now is that um, it now explicitly describes that you should have your sheet film in paper enclosures, which is awesome. This was this huge argument that I would get into all the time with our safety folks and our fire folks because they would say, well, the weight should include the paper sleeves. And I'm like, I don't want to include the paper sleeves because I'm reducing the density of the material by putting it in the box. Plus, it has all this labeling information. I have to have this sleeve. I have to have this sleeve. I don't think it should count. The paper is flammable, but it's not adding actually that much fire load compared to the nitrate that's with it. And plus, in my experience with fires, paper materials are much better in fires because they absorb a lot of water and would help you cool down the fire. That's how you put, down, uh, put out a nitrate fire. So th this, is a, this is good. So it very clearly make, in this uh, standard now says that you can have things in paper sleeves. They recommend it for still picture film. And it also is very clear from my reading of the standard that it, it's not part of the weight. So it's, it's resolved this issue in a good way as far as I'm concerned. The one thing I would say, and this is a, a good a, a thanks to Peter, is that this Peter would never allow this kind of, a four, what's a four flap envelope? I know what they mean, but the term is four flap enclosure. Envelopes don't have more than one flap typically. So this is the kind of thing that when we use, a, uh, a, like say, 18902, uh, Peter was very, very thorough in standards meetings about getting things correct. And this is just an example of a little bit of, of inexact in stuff that makes you a little concerned about other parts of the standard. But you know what they mean. But Peter was very good about making sure that things were correct. So I'll quickly go through transportation. If you have a lot of film, this becomes, <laughs> this becomes a bit of a nightmare. There are all sorts of rules. My, my colleague, Donna Collins, is the, she is the master of these rules. She has special training in doing this. Um, it's, you just need, if you have a lot of film to move, that is hundreds of pounds to move, you need, and you're having a shipper do it, you need to be very careful about it and follow these rules. Uh, we've had to move the film back and forth lots of times between Washington, Dayton, Ohio, back, back, and then back to its new home in Culpeper. But we, we thousands of miles, lots of trucks, um, a real headache. But we did it. it did, nothing happened. We had to pop. So that's why we had to have all these boxes. In particular, we had to have these boxes because we were transporting them and we felt like we really had to follow the rules. Uh, it takes lots of time and effort, lots of people. We, they ended up being put into drums into, and oil drums with packing material around them. These are some polyethylene slings, so you can get them in and out. Um, this is also particularly helpful for the film cans. It takes a lot of people. That's me in younger days sitting on there. We're all, we're all exhausted. We had to do this once. We had to do it, let's see, we started on the, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving and had to have everything out by Saturday. That, that was a fun week. Fun week because they forgot that the still picture film was in the vault. That was that was that was brilliant. It was brilliant, but it all worked out. I shouldn't have said that. This is now recorded for posterity, but so so be it. I said it. So, ten truckloads, eighty drums. This was all of the material. It's a lot. It's a lot. Now the one thing is that then people bring up. They're like, well, can't we just get rid of it? Well, actually, you can. Um, but it costs even more to get rid of it than it does to transport it. It costs about twice as much to dispose of it. And be careful. Do not say you're going to get rid of it. Because once you've said that you're going to get rid of it, it's not a hazardous material anymore. It's hazardous waste. And you can't take it back. And now you have a real headache on your time, on your hands, because time is ticking. So do be very, very careful about how you say you're going to discard film. Have a process and say we're considering it. But do not say you're going to get rid of it, because um, then you can't move it as hazardous material anymore. You have to move it as hazardous waste, and you have to have someone do it for you. You can't do it yourself. Um, so be careful of that. So there's the truck. And then you have to get into fun logistics like this. Like, where do you put all of the drums and all of the all of this stuff? We had to have all these shipments, cram it all in here. Then you get into other fun things like you know freezer trucks. They don't have lift gates, because they back up into into storage areas that don't need lift gates. Well, how do you get pallets of this material into the truck? So you have to have a forklift. So you have to you have forklift and nitrate film is not something you want to you don't want to have forklift go into a can drum. So it's fun times, fun times. So be careful about disposal. 
as I said, it can be, it can be expensive and you need to be careful about how you're saying you're going to dispose of it. So generally, my recommendation is that you have a formal deaccessioning process and you should follow it with these materials and you don't deaccession it until you've worked out that you actually are going to dispose of it and how you're going to do it. And you just say, well, we're in the process of considering to deaccession it. That, that seems to make people happy. So what to do? This is a lot of information. I've been talking real quickly. Um, I think it's just more to update you that if you have particularly small amounts of film, um, you have a lot of options. The, the, other, the other thing is that the standard doesn't go into great detail about, like, you, you can't put 50 pounds of film in a, in a refrigerator or freezer, but it doesn't say how many refrigerators or freezers you can have in a building. So that's a, there's a little bit of wiggle room in there. Um, you can't have just infinite amounts of, of little tiny freezers, but I think that you could, if you had 75 pounds, you probably could have reasonably three set freezers or refrigerators separated by various fire rated walls. And I think you would be well within the spirit of the, of the standard. But again, you need to work with your other stakeholders in your in institution. Um, you need to know how much you have. Um, you need to know the quantity. You, know, you need to know where it is. And you really do need to know the condition. And as I said, you will be the expert on this. And I think that's one of the other things um, that Peter was really helpful on. He, um, I serve on the ISO um, photographic standards, and Peter made it really clear what a good and well thought out standard was like, and that was really helpful for me when we're trying to interpret NFPA 40, particularly before 2016, where it was very difficult to interpret, and it made me much more confident of how to navigate through interpreting a standard, because people will take them sort of very literally, and they're generally products of consensus, and they're written in such a way that you really can make good decisions, but it's really important that if you have a large amount of this that you get familiar with the standard and, um, and talk with other people in terms of best practices of what they do. Because you really have two concerns. You have a safety concern and you have a preservation concern. I'm almost done. So um, it was funny. I, I think it was, there was a talk that described um, incanabula uh, with these early materials. And I absolutely agree with that. I think that these materials will be will be considered in a very different light and in the sort of way we look at Book of Hours now. And it's not just um, something that we use for prayer. It's something that we value in other ways because it speaks to a time that is different from our own. Um, similar in some ways, but different in others. And in the same way that we particularly value books before the age of the printing press and we, we value things that are on parchment, um, you describe the people, no, this wasn't on paper, it wasn't in Western Europe yet, we don't have, no, it's on parchment, it's animal skin, it's not paper. I think negatives will have a similar kind of thing in an age that's increasingly visual, but not particularly used to looking at things in reverse. Um, I think that our negative collections will take on value in a way that we can't completely describe. And I think it's well worth preserving them. Not only is it, I think, more cost effective, I think it's also something we, we should do just as as responsible stewards. So many thanks. Um, Debbie and Monique and I started on this nitrate acetate uh, journey a long time ago. Um, Peter for just his help with um, knowing what a good standard is like, how to interpret it, and just his, his encouragement and good humor about uh, things um, film and non-film. Um, Nora and Sarah at the Smithsonian have been very helpful as we've worked together in moving our materials. And my colleagues at the uh, library, some of whom are no longer there, but were at the time, uh, Sarah Wagner, Donna Collins, who's still there, Jen Lewis, who helped with making a lot of our boxes, and my boss, Elmer Usman, who uh, humors me in allowing me to still remain a technical expert in something, and, and I guess nitrate is the thing that I do. So many thanks to everybody. And if you have questions, this started sort of in 2003. If you have questions and, and you're concerned about your still picture film, contact me. Um, I can be helpful. I have a lot of experience and, uh, and I can put you in contact with people. And particularly if you have questions about how to interpret an FPA 40, I'm happy to help. And um, for those of you from foreign places, I would gladly take whatever information you have about um, the various standards or, or appendices to your national rules because I would be gladly, uh, gladly included in the fact because there are slightly different rules in different places. Um, there's a Swedish standard that's, that um, is quite different than this. Um, it says basically still picture film isn't as dangerous. So it, I'd like to um, collect that. So if you have it, um, I'd, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>